We're just going to give it a few minutes to let our attendees come in. All right, we were, well, go ahead and get started. So welcome to Guiding Growth, Conversations with Community Leaders. This series convenes local leaders on a variety of topics concerning our business community and is presented by Dignity Health Mercy Gilbert Medical Center, Phoenix Mesa Gateway Airport, with further support by Cox Business and Arizona State University. And today's topic is presented by Deloitte. I am going to ask our presenting sponsors to share in our closing comments. So today I'd like to invite Matt Evan of Deloitte to share a business message with you. Matt, we're gonna have you unmute. Sorry about that. You're okay. Thank you, Sarah. And wonderful to be here with everyone and to be a sponsor of this event. Uh, just a, a little bit of information about us, uh, Deloitte. We uh, actually just moved here a couple of years ago. We opened our doors in Gilbert in uh, 2018 and have really experienced significant growth while we've been here. We started with six folks and now we're over uh, 800 folks and counting. We have our uh, facilities over in the Revilon uh, office park development. Uh, we have two buildings, each with 100,000 square feet. So we can see the, about 2,000 folks here. Uh, we did have a chance to look at quite a number of areas to locate our office. And Gilbert came out as our top location and we've been pleased with that uh, decision ever since. We do a lot of work, obviously, for a lot of commercial uh, clients, both in commercial and in uh, government clients. And it includes audit, advisory, tax, and consulting services. So we're pleased to be here recruiting here and adding many more folks. So again, great to be sponsoring this event and looking forward to the panelists and hearing all the, the great things that uh, will be presented here. Back to you, Sarah. Thank you. We are so grateful for our sponsors and for making this possible and for our partnership with Deloitte as well. For our attendees, you're gonna notice at the bottom of your screen a Q&A option. If you'd like to submit a question during the presentation, feel free to submit it through this option or you can raise your virtual hand and I can attempt to facilitate your questions that way as well. And with that, um, on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce, we're so grateful for our collaboration with the Town of Gilbert's Office of Economic De development and the collaborative spirit we have towards a vibrant business community allows for great things to happen here in Gilbert. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dan Henderson, Director of Office of Economic Development to facilitate today's conversation with our esteemed panelists. Sarah, thank you and good to be with you all today. Uh, Sarah mentioned, uh, my name is Dan Henderson and I serve as the Director for the Office of Economic Development here in Gilbert and delighted to be with you all as well as uh, this esteemed panel. Um, very excited about uh, today's topic, transportation trends and influences. Um, we've got a fantastic lineup of, uh, of not only attendees, but also uh, of panelists. And so um, with that, um, I'd like to um, uh, briefly have each of the panelists uh, introduce themselves. And if it's all right, I'd like to start with Vice Mayor Young Kaprosky for a brief introduction. Thanks, Dan. Um, as Dan mentioned, my name is Young Kaprowski. I am currently the Vice Mayor of the Town of Gilbert. I was appointed to this position in April of this year, um, started serving in May. I am actually also a civil engineer and I work as a consultant engineer in transportation. I own my own consulting firm and have been working in the Valley for the past 14 years. Um, so today I'll be providing a, a perspective both from the town of Gilbert and what we're doing and what we're planning. And it can also answer any industry related questions. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, and next, uh, Supervisor Jack Sellers, a uh, brief introduction. Thank you, Dan, I'll try to make it brief. 
Uh, most of you know me, but I am Jack Sellers, District 1 Maricopa County Supervisor, and I'm currently Vice Chair, so I expect to be Chair next year. In my previous life, I was the Facilities Manager for the General Motors Desert Proving Grounds, and I served two terms on the Chandler City Council, including being Vice Mayor, and I com completed a six-year term on the State Transportation Board as Chairman. Uh, I've been involved with the Maricopa Association of Governments for more than 10 years, including serving as chair of the Transportation Policy Committee. A priority for me as chair of the Board of Supervisors will be developing a plan to properly extend Prop 400 that will give our county the same authority every other county has in the state and a plan that addresses rapidly changing technology and what it will take to maintain or improve the lifestyle that makes corporations and people want to move here. So thank you. You bet, thank you. Appreciate you, appreciate your comments and congratulations uh, on being uh, voted into office. Um, next, I'd like to go over to uh, Ryan Smith with Phoenix Mesa Gateway Airport, a uh, brief introduction, and then perhaps Ryan, you could jump into your presentation. Yeah, my name is Ryan Smith. I'm the Director of Communications and Government Relations here at Phoenix Mesa Gateway Airport. I've been here about uh, five years, uh, fifth generation Arizonan, so have uh, seen how, how transportation has significantly changed, uh, you know, the makeup of this, of this valley and of this state, and um, excited for all the great things to come. So, uh, Matt, were you ever, ever able to get the presentation? Ever got Matt, it? Through, sorry. That's okay. So we we had uh, we had some presentation issues here, some screen sharing issues here, um, which uh, which caused some some problems. So um, so Phoenix Mesa Gateway Airport, as as you guys may know, um, is uh, is is really the center point of kind of the the, the far southeast valley. Uh, we have three 10,000 foot runways that connect um, really anywhere in the world. Uh, we, we, launch, uh, uh, we launch Boeing helicopters out of here. We have uh, 182 Cessnas that, that fly students and, and teach students how to fly out here. So, so really uh, the, the world is your oyster here at Phoenix Mesa Gateway Airport. Um, the confluence of the 202 and the, uh, the future state route 24 um, is another significant aspect of the airport um, that as it continues to grow and it continues to link in with, with other areas in, uh, in, the, in the far Southeast Valley, um, this area is, is only gonna become more and more important as we move forward. Um, we, uh, in terms of, of connecting, uh, connections again, we fly to 50, uh, nearly 50 destinations nonstop. And that brings a significant amount of people uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to the greater Phoenix area, to the Southeast Valley. Uh, last year, we were on pace to hit 1.8 million passengers, um, bringing those in. We have, uh, we've actually been very, very lucky in the fact that through, through this pandemic, uh, industry-wide air traffic is down anywhere from 60 to 80%, depending on the airport. Uh, Phoenix Mesa Gateway Airport, though, we have only uh, experienced really about a 20 to 25 percent uh, drop in passenger traffic. Um, Industry-wide, the, the assumption is that uh, leisure travel will lead the resurgence uh, and the kind of the recovery, and we have seen that here at Phoenix Mesa Gateway Airport. Um, so we continue to bring people to stay here, visit family, visit friends. Um, you know, that non-business travel, I think, will, will continue to, 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 to lead the way um, as we go forward. So some of the, some of the, the, the real major things which, uh, which we will be a part of and, and really where, where transportation comes in in the future of, uh, you know, the Southeast Valley is, are, are two large developments. First is Skybridge, Arizona. Uh, Skybridge, Arizona is... Uh, a, a, a partnership with a Mexican court, uh, consortium of companies. They uh, have plans to develop this 360 acres here at Phoenix Mesa Gateway Airport. Uh, we could see three to 4 million square feet of warehouse space. Um, 
with direct connections and direct, ac direct access through that, what they consider that sky bridge um, to the rest of the world. One of the leading um, uh, drivers of this is uh, e-commerce through what we call the Unified Cargo Processing Program. Uh, Phoenix Mesa Gateway Airport is the first and only inland airport in the entire country to have a unified cargo processing program. And what that means is that here on site at the airport, we have both Mexican and U.S. customs agents uh, located here, available. And so you can, uh, right now, in, in Mexico and Latin American countries, we don't have uh, that same, that next day Amazon Prime type service. And, and so um, as those economies continue to grow and as that, that uh, service grows in popularity, um, we have the ability to uh, provide that next day, uh, those next day goods without having that two week lag or that, that 10 to 15 day lag that you find when shipping things to Mexico. Um, so that, that allows American manufacturers uh, and Ameri American uh, warehouse uh, you know, owners to, to have their goods here, get them next day or within two days into the Mexican and Latin American communities without having those, uh, those huge um, burdens of and, and delays in, in customs. So that's something that we will continue to uh, build upon, that we'll continue to grow. And, and that's one of those things that, again, having that, that transportation and having that infrastructure in place uh, to be able to uh, not only get goods to the airport, but um, then connect them throughout the world. That, that's where uh, transportation really is critical. Um, the next real large development that we're going to be rolling out early next week or early next year is called uh, Gateway East. Uh, and that is on the east side, um, frontage to the 24 and Ellsworth Road. Uh, and, and that really is kind of the last kind of the last salvo for the, for the airport in terms of uh, what our future development holds. Uh, that has, a, it, it's up to 700 acres. We've, we've cut off about 200 acres for a future uh, terminal, um, passenger terminal. That, that'll be really demand driven um, when we get those passenger numbers up. Uh, that's, when, that's when they'll be there. But again, tying in that 24 and the, the Loop 202 and having that accessibility um, it really is going to be critical, but this will allow us to, again, uh, bring in that, those, those manufacturing, those high wage jobs, uh, and, and having the, the ease of, of getting to and from the airport area is going to be critical. Um, it's going to be critical for us, uh, as we move forward. And that's. That's kind of the overview of the airport that we've got right now. Um, you know, we, we like to say that we, we really are a critical point, uh, a critical part of the overall transportation system uh, and having three 10,000 foot runways uh, that allow you to get wherever in the world is, uh, is, is a, key, a key part of that. Absolutely, Ryan, thank you very much. And, um, Saw a comment come in from uh, John Kruger and indicating love that El airport and felt so safe traveling over Thanksgiving. And so thanks for continuing to deliver just an incredible experience for not only the East Valley and beyond, but but also being that economic juggernaut in the, in the East Valley. And so um, with that, um, we've got some questions that uh, that will be um uh, reviewing with you and uh, and addressing and looking forward to your comments there. But at this time, I'd like to invite uh, Vice Mayor Young Kaprowski to um, present. I know she has a brief presentation as well. And so, Vice Mayor. Thank you. Let me just get my screen sharing here. Hopefully you can all see that. Um, so I just wanted to briefly talk about, you know, what's happening in Gilbert, what are some current projects um, and kind of what's up next. We have our general plan that was just ratified in the August election. And it actually has a lot of information in there about our transportation goals. We really want to um, effectively manage congestion in the future, maintain our current roadways, improve our mobility choices to include transit and multimodal non-motorized choices, we always have a main focus on transportation safety 
and we're also looking at planning for new technology to ensure that we can have a very efficient transportation system um, that can accommodate our large town. <laughs> the town of Gilbert is the largest town uh, in the US and we're expected to be over 250,000 people um, in this year's census. We have a lot of roadways to maintain. And this slide shows you know, our most important transportation issues, but transportation as a whole is also one of our residents' number one issues. And, um, uh, and within transportation, we, because we're still growing, there's a lot of development, especially in the Southeast portion of Gilbert. Um, some of the, the number one issue is congestion and, and trying to address that. And a lot of that is, is addressed through capacity improvements and building new, new roadways and expanding new roadways um, in those areas that are being newly developed. Um, and then also next is pedestrian amenities, then cut through traffic, having transit service, and then the road conditions maintaining uh, the pavement quality. So I wanna just talk about a couple of projects that have been recently completed. Um, the town spends approximately $150 million on CIP projects each year. And a portion of that is on transportation projects. So we have, we have a lot of projects going on with um, Baseline, Lindsay, doing a lot of safety improvements to eliminate negative offset left turns and then working towards um, preparing for the Lindsay Road SR and, and 202 traffic interchange, which is gonna actually start construction in January. Um, so the, some of the other projects that we have going on include uh, a few projects on Val Vista Drive, um, Rucker and Jermaine, and most of our projects are actually um, spread out throughout the town, but a lot are occurring in, that, um, in the Southern part of, of town. And then our trails projects, our, our trails are actually part of our Parks and Recreation Department, um, but they're a really vital part of our transportation network and they provide great recreation opportunities and connections. Um, so we have a current construction project happening on the Powerline Trail, um, the Western Powerline Trail, and then we have a few in design and, and, and pre-design along the Powerline Trail as well. One of the reasons why I applied um, to be appointed to Gilbert Town Council was because I was serving on the Citizens Transportation Task Force. And last year when we were working through that, um, our work on that task force, we were preparing for a transportation and infrastructure bond for the town of Gilbert. Um, the bond election has been postponed until November of next year. Um, but this bond election is a general obligation bond, which is estimated to be um, a, a, a comprehensive package of about $500 million. Gilbert is also undergoing a lot of um, planning projects right now. We're in the midst of our transportation master plan update, which will be completed um, around this time next year. We've just finished uh, projects related to our trail system and safety improvements for 46 trail crossings of arterial and collector roadways. We're also currently working on a transportation systems management and operation plan. So that relates more with intelligent transportation systems at, and technology and have also recently completed um, a fiber optic network um, plan so that we can build that out, which would support uh, future intelligent transportation um, infrastructure. And we're also focused on school safety and other congestion improvements, including um, you know, numerous um, improvements to traffic signals and Valley Metro is also conducting a transit planning study. I, I wanted to touch briefly on um, some of the regional planning that's also being done for high capacity transit. Because we get the question a lot as to whether, you know, light rail might be coming in to Gilbert. And I just wanted to illustrate this map um, is from a MAG plan and MAG and Valley Metro typically lead any of those transit plans. 
um, in close partnership with the town of Gilbert. So this map shows the existing and committed light rail, um, which is in the yellow, and there's no plans for that to continue um, into Gilbert. Um, however, you can see that along Gilbert Road, there is an alignment uh, potentially proposed for bus rapid transit. And these are all just potential. There's also been two commuter rail stations identified within Gilbert um, as part of the ADOT and MAG commuter rail studies, but those um, projects have been unfunded um, or currently unfunded, but could potentially be in the Prop 400 extension, which I believe um, Jack will be talking to later in the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Young. Appreciate the update. And there's a lot of information there, certainly. And so um, I, I love that um, we were able to use this format to get some information out there, not only about the great work uh, at Phoenix Mesa Gateway, but also the tie in to um, what the local community is doing um, as part of uh, our transportation master planning. And so um, with that, uh, we've already seen a couple of questions come in, but I real quickly wanted to um, uh, start the discussion off um, with uh, perhaps starting with uh, Supervisor Sellers. Um, from your perspective, what is working well in terms of transportation at this time? Okay, well, what has worked well is the fact that we have a metropolitan planning organization called MAG that really brings our region together to talk about things that are important for our region. And with things like Prop 300 and Prop 400, we've done an outstanding job of planning for our future. And that's contributed to us being the fastest growing county in the United States for the last three years. But I will, I will add a, a caveat to that. And that is that with us continuing to grow like that, unless we put together a plan that is worthy of that growth going forward, uh, we can't sustain our lifestyle. So we, it's really, really critical that we do the right kind of work in putting together an extension for Prop 400. And um, we'll talk about that some more later. But, but I am also pleased that uh, Gilbert uh, is, is really doing some, and, and I, I will mention that one of the things I've done since I've been uh, on the Board of Supervisors is had regular meetings with the municipalities in my district to talk about transportation issues and, and look at what we need to do going forward. And certainly I think that Gateway Airport with Skybridge is a game changer for the region. Uh, having a rail service to that airport commuter rail as well as uh, connecting for commerce with uh, Skybridge there is going to be a critical part of what we need. And certainly that area has extreme con congestion now, uh, partly because of pass-through traffic from Pinal going to all the good jobs in Gilbert and Chandler and other places. But uh, so I, I think it's, it's pretty exciting to be involved in planning this future. I, I credit Gilbert with being smart enough to put an engineer on their council. That's going to help. So uh, I'm, I'm excited about the future. Thank you, Jack. Appreciate, uh, appreciate your comments. And uh, I think it's always a great place to start with uh, um, what, what's working well. And as we start looking at um, the opposite of that, some of the challenges we face certainly um, Jack, you, you mentioned uh, a couple, um, as you note, uh, sort of the caveats there, but I'd like to open up um, uh, to Vice Mayor and certainly Ryan, if, uh, if there are any challenges that you'd like to add to what uh, Supervisor Sellers mentioned in terms of his caveats. Unless the Vice Mayor has something, the one thing I will add is that we, I, we've had so much growth out here in this area that I don't, uh, one of the difficulty things, the difficult things that we're going to face is making sure all these new residents and all of these wonderful people that have moved here understand truly how transform transformational Prop 400 was. Um, without Prop 400, 
we would not be here today. None of us would. Um, because uh, building the 202 loop and, and all of these different um, corridors that we have, the jobs that we go to would not be possible without Prop 400. And so as we talk about what that next phase is gonna be, it truly is gonna set up the next generation of growth and uh, an opportunity here in the, in the Valley. And it's, it's great to see that cities, um, uh, that even very conservative cities like Gilbert and like Mesa have continually approved transportation bonds and, and have looked at, at planning for the future because that's truly, it really does tie in, um, you know, ties in the success for every Phoenix Mesa Gateway Airport would not exist as a passenger service airport had it not been for Prop 400 and the ability to build those freeways. And the points, right? Vice Mayor? Yeah, I'll just add that, you know, with the challenges, it's, um, I, I think we're going to talk a little bit about this later, but is funding with uh, Prop 400 uh, sunsetting soon. And with even for, for, for town of Gilbert, the reason why we are going out for a transportation and infrastructure bond next year is because our past general obligation bonds have been um, expended and the highway user revenue funds you know, are, are insufficient to really um, accommodate all the growth and transportation infrastructure that's needed. Um, I think in the future, we're also going to need to make sure that we um, educate citizens because it's really easy to understand what it means to build a new traffic interchange or build a new roadway, but it's a little bit harder to um, kind of pass along the information that now we need to maintain all of this infrastructure that we have. And instead of seeing us build new, uh, build new and add capacity, we're now going to modernize and manage and maintain those systems. And we need to make sure that our residents understand that that's equally important um, to the new to the new infrastructure. Excellent, excellent points. Excellent. Um, yeah. One of the questions that came up, uh, came over for you, Ryan, and um, it talks about, um, uh, gateways tracking uh, TFOAs, and is that information available to the public, uh, first and foremost? And then um, how does the growth of Phoenix Mesa Gateway year over year affect the value of the surrounding communities, say, for example, like Power Ranch and, and uh, Morrison Ranch? Yeah, so for, for those uh, uh, acronym uh, like t uh, TFOAs or things falling off aircraft, um, luckily we, we uh, we have not to date, at least in the five years that I've been here, uh, heard anything like that. Um, we do track, uh, we do track flight patterns. We work extensively with the local communities. Uh, we just went through, it's been three years now, uh, a land use um, combat compatibility plan. And what that is, is that looks at all of the future growth of Gateway. Uh, everybody that moves around here, um, obviously if they do a little driving, they know they're moving by an airport, but you'd be surprised of, um, you know, unless you, if you're buying a house, you're not there for a, a 24 hour period, you're there at certain times of the day. And so what we like to do is we like to over communicate. Um, and in, in coordination with the, with the surrounding communities, Gilbert, Queen Creek, Mesa specifically, because they're, they're the three communities that are located in the flight path. We have gone out and really, uh, put together a, a great land use plan to ensure that we don't have encroachment um, on the airport and that that the zoning that's nearby and, and, and right next to the airport is compatible. It's, you know, industrial, it's office, it's those kinds of uses that are compatible with the airport. Um, and, and again, that took the partnership. It's a partnership that you don't see really in throughout the country, uh, whereas you have three communities working together to make sure that uh, that you have a successful airport and that you're not gonna run into issues 10, 15 years down the line. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, one of the things that Supervisor Sellers uh, briefly talked about in his, um, uh, in his comments was, was Maricopa Association of Government and, and how municipalities work together for regional planning. Um, but, um, I'd, I'd like to get into this idea of how is transportation funded? And I'll open up that to, uh, to all three of you, uh, if you care to uh, uh, provide a comment on that. So the question at hand, how is transportation funded? Well, and, and I think that's 
that's an important question because it could have been talked about under the challenges portion. Uh, you know, we, we get funding, uh, the majority of our funding right now is coming from the half cent sales tax in this region for capital projects. A, a major issue that we're dealing with right now is that that money is supposed to be dedicated for capital projects and then the state takes over any state uh, highway or freeway and maintains it. And currently that's done principally with the fuel tax, which I'll briefly mention, I, I feel is a misnomer. It's a user fee, it's not a tax, and it's not even paying for maintenance today. Uh, maintenance is so underfunded that Maricopa County, or not Maricopa County, but the Maricopa Association of Governments has been talking about increasing their ask for a property, for, I mean, for a, a, a sales tax to try to include some maintenance. And I'm very much opposed to that. I want to tell our state legislators, live up to your duties and, and provide the money to, to support maintenance of these facilities. Uh, you know, anytime we take something over, we'll never, we'll never be able to give it back. And we need more than a half cent just to do the projects to keep us moving forward because the other revenue sources really are not keeping up, you know, with the, the improved fuel economy and uh, with the move towards hybrid and, and electric vehicles that we're witnessing. Uh, we really need to be able to, uh, to be looking at alternate uh, funding sources. And, you know, the people have argued with me that uh, increasing the fuel tax is a short-term solution. I say, let's have a short-term solution while we figure out what to do long-term. But uh, uh, Representative Campbell's bill last year really addressed a lot of that because he, he put in uh, fees for hybrid vehicles and for all fuel vehicles that would have moved us in the right direction. Uh, and I think we really need to be smart about doing those kind of things. Uh, we've, we've got, again, like I said in, in some of my opening remarks, unless, we, unless we're willing to put together a plan with the funding to keep the ball moving forward, we're not going to be able to maintain the lifestyle that makes people want to be, people and companies want to be here. Yeah, Supervisor Sellers is exactly right. And uh, just a note on that um, gas user fee, which is the Highway User Revenue Fund, um, that I think it's 18 cents a gallon hasn't changed for over 25 years. Um, and so that's a big challenge um, you know, across the nation. Um, it, in addition to the, the Maricopa County sales tax, the other funding sources that municipalities can use um, are general obligation bonds, which would come through Gilbert's secondary property tax rate levy. And then also there's some federal funding that does come through the Maricopa Association of Governments. And that federal funding um, can help fund projects uh, that relate to um, transportation alternatives, they relate to uh, intelligent transportation system projects or any projects that help with air quality and then the arterial life cycle program. And that comes through the FAST Act by the federal government. Um, but there needs to be an, um, a more long-term transportation infrastructure legislation approved soon because they're just kind of extending the current act. Well, and, I, and I'll add to that, that you know a big concern of mine, particularly while I was serving on the state transportation board is that when the federal government talks about putting together a trillion dollar or more infrastructure plan, unless you have the matching dollars to bring that to your area, you're gonna lose out. And we don't have a plan right now for how we would accomplish that. Yep. Those are very, very good points. And I, I like how we're able to talk about sort of the federal side, the state side, the county side, you know, and the local obligations, you know, as it relates to um, transportation funding. Um, sort of shifting gears a little bit um, in terms of transportation performance, um, how is transportation performance measured and why?
I think one of the key things that we look at uh, at MAG and also at ADOT and for that matter at Maricopa County is, is congestion and time lost in congestion. Uh, and that's not just for people commuting and, and personal loss of time uh, and, and impact on quality of life, but on moving commerce. And you know, when you get to a point where you can't efficiently move commerce, you're going to start losing jobs. They'll start moving to other areas. And you know, even when we talk about intelligent transportation uh, systems, and, and that's gonna be a critical part of our future, because you really can do a significant job of managing congestion with that. But we don't have the infrastructure right now to support the commerce that we're going to need for the people moving to this area. And, and so we really need to have a capital plan as well as an intelligent plan uh, as we go forward. And, and, and that requires flexibility in our planning process. And that's something that, uh, that I will be talking with a lot of you about is convincing our legislature to let us do more of this at the local level so that we can put flexibility in our plan and, and react to the things that really do help all of our communities as we go forward. Yeah, for surface transportation, um, the congestion is definitely a critical factor and probably the one that most people kind of remember and can relate to because you think of, of being in your vehicle, you know, stopped at a traffic signal, you know, waiting for that red light. But there's a lot of other factors um, that are measured. As Supervisor Sellers mentioned, you know, the freight movement has, you know, really been highlighted as being extra important, especially during this pandemic, to make sure that the goods movement um, stays um, intact. And then also, just the 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 choices of of modes having different modes um, air quality is a factor in the mag region um, so there's just different factors that are looked at a lot of it is yeah delay another one that is really important that we want to always keep track of is transportation safety so as we make these improvements we also really um, prioritize uh, safety to make sure that we are reducing the serious injuries and fatalities that occur due to uh, motor vehicle crashes thank you um when it comes to transportation and we start thinking about innovation impacting transportation. What do you feel Gilbert, the region um, and employers can be thinking about when it comes to those innovations um, impacting transportation? We've had a lot of transportation kind of disruptions uh, just in the past you know, few years, uh, especially with uh, kind of the infusion of technology. So we already have uh, like ride share, so Uber and Lyft. You probably know about Waymo that operates um, in Chandler and other parts of the Valley. And those are more on the private side. On the public side, there's a lot of different, um, different technologies and ways that our municipal governments are managing traffic operations that you may not even know about right now, but they have implemented you know, a lot of um, really great projects and programs throughout the region and continue to do so as those technologies develop. And that's something that's important to Gilbert, especially with our build out of our fiber optic network, because those are, that's our communication. And we, we have to rely on, on fiber optic network because it's more reliable than if we were to, to look at um, wireless or cellular solutions. Well, and, and certainly I, you know, I talked about uh, congestion being mitigated by the use of intelligent transportation solutions. But the number one thing you gain from intelligent solutions is improved safety. You know, 90 or 95% of all accidents are human error. And when you have automated systems doing that, the error gets down close to zero. Uh, and, and certainly when we look at, um, at things like uh, mass transit in the future, uh, having automated buses 
or even automated vans may replace the need for fixed rail. And so we, we need, as I said before, we need to be putting together a plan that addresses the kind of funding we need for what we're going to have to accomplish as we go forward, but with the flexibility to be able to, uh, to move in the direction that, that really does make the most economic sense and the most uh, lifestyle sense for us going forward. Excellent points. I have a couple of questions that came up through the uh, through the chat. Um, one is for you, uh, Vice Mayor, and it's regarding um, the major changes to culture and life within the world as a whole. Uh, it's great to see fiber is being built, um, but are we considering allowing Gilbert to be an ISP to our residents uh, as to not be held hostage by um, the other two sort of uh, providers on the market like Cox and, and CenturyLink. And so the, the question was, you know, are we, are we thinking about uh, 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 fiber networks in, in Gilbert um, or as a municipality as a whole? That's a really great question, really interesting question. There are communities um, across the country that have decided to become their own internet, internet service provider. Um, and I have not had too many discussions about that in Gilbert. So it it could certainly be a topic that 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 could be brought up. But currently, I think our main vision for our fiber optic, optic network um, as a pri as as the primary use is for our infrastructure. So that would be to provide communications to all of our traffic signals, um, to vehicle charging stations, to all the intelligent systems that get added to the parking garages in the Heritage District. There's just a whole host of um, town owned infrastructure that needs that communication first and foremost. And then um, as that is completely built out, which is still going to take a lot of time um, and is going to um, potentially take some private partner, uh, public private partnerships to actually implement town wide, um, then that could be on the table to be an ISP. Well, thank you. This one's for supervisor sellers. Are we proactively encouraging the growth of electronic uh, or electric charging stations. Uh, the, the question goes on to say the missing infrastructure seems to be a focus point missing for electric car market and with multiple groups moving to a green focus. How are we as a community or as a region planning to embrace and grow faster? You know, I, I think we've been, we've been working to do that uh, as smartly as we can uh, and, and a big part of that goes back to the public utilities. And for them, uh, you know, for us spending public dollars, we have to, we have to be very, very careful about how we, how we do things. But, and the public utilities that would be providing the electric service for these charging stations uh, aren't going to do that until they can see at least some future return on that. Uh, I, I think we're making good progress. You know, everywhere I go these days, I see charging stations. And a lot of that is, is going to be centered on having batteries that can be charged quicker uh, and, and will uh, hold a charge longer for, for more distances. Uh, and I think we're getting there quickly now as, as more of the manufacturers are, are causing increased competition in this area. You know, but going back to the future of transportation in general, I, I should also mention that, and I'm sure the vice mayor is involved in this as much as I am, but, you know, I, I think one of the important things for this area, because we're a relatively young growing area, is to become a smart region. And to become a smart region takes more than just buying hardware or software, it means that you have to have committed people involved. And we have some really good people and Deloitte is, is very involved in that along with ASU, uh, which is very encouraging to me. But you know, when we build infrastructure, we're not just talking about road systems, we're talking about communication infrastructure that would be a part of that system. And the average, the average uh, resident doesn't really know 
when they cross from Gilbert into Queen Creek or Gilbert into Chandler or Chandler into Tempe, we need systems that support all of us. And, uh, and so that's, and, and I'm pretty proud to say, even when I served on the Chandler City Council that people referred to me as the regional council member because I, I recognized early on and I learned even more as I became a state transportation board member that people in general just don't, don't know when they go from one border to the next. All they know is they want to get from point A to point B as efficiently as possible. And they want, when, they, when they're dealing with commerce, they want the commerce to happen as efficiently as possible. And so that's, that's really the focus that we need to have and become a, a smart region is really a critical part of that going forward. Excellent, excellent points. Um, I've got another question. This is sort of uh, to, to the general public. Is there any thought to utilize more joint ventures like Connect 202 partners to build new roads with long-term maintenance contracts? Well, I suppose I'm the one that should answer that as well. Uh, you know, the, uh, and, and that was really uh, a very good thing that finally came together. I, I got frustrated early on because we were trying to advance uh, the construction of, of the South, South Mountain Freeway uh, before ADOT really uh, was ready to award a contract. Uh, but when they finally did it and they brought together the partnership there and not only did they bring together a partnership, but they included, it was a design, build, maintain contract. Uh, and that does a number of things. Not only does it relieve us now of, of worrying about how it's gonna be maintained going forward, but it also tells whoever's building it, you're gonna be responsible for the maintenance. So, so if you have ideas that's gonna make this last longer and better, then they, sh they need to be incorporated in the design. And so it really turned out to be a very, very good project. And, and I, I was very proud to be uh, very involved in that as we went forward. You know, we've got a, a really, uh, the, the most disruptive project ever for this region is coming up uh, soon. And that's the Broadway curve, the Interstate 10 Broadway curve a very critical project, both for commuting and for commerce. Uh, but uh, because every bridge in that curve is going to have to be replaced, there's just no way that it, that it won't be disruptive. You know, they're saying they're gonna keep all the traffic lanes on Interstate 10 open during business hours. Uh, but regardless of that, it's going to be disruptive for the service streets that, that cross it. Uh, and just for entering and exiting and whatever. Uh, it's gonna be, uh, and it's a $700 million project. So it's also a very costly project, but it's, it's gonna be something everybody needs to stay very well informed about. And we're working hard to make sure people learn what it's gonna be, what it's going to be and, and what it's going to impact. Thank you for those comments. I've got one last question over to you, Ryan. Uh, is there any plans to attract additional airline carriers to the Phoenix Mesa Gateway Airport over the next five years? So that's the ironic thing is we, we we're actually we've actually done transportation so great here in the valley that it's really easy to get to Sky Harbor. Uh, but as the as the Southeast Valley continues to grow, um, just like in other areas, you see reliever airports and, and secondary airports, Gateway Airport will develop into that. Our main focus is, uh, you know, much to, I know I'll disappoint some people, is not on the Southwest or the, the Americans of, uh, of the world, but what it is is looking for like a daily flight on a, on a United into Denver, something that if you're a businessman in, or business, uh, if you've got business in Denver or, or beyond, that you can catch a flight at Gateway in the morning and come back at night or, uh, or, or come back the next day. That daily business uh, product is something that we continue to work on. Uh, we, have, we have meetings scheduled. It's something that, uh, you know, as time comes, uh, it'll get there. Um, but that's really kind of our next focus. Thank you, Ryan. Um, I real quickly just want to thank you uh, Vice Mayor Kaprowski, Supervisor Sellers, Ryan, for your time today. This is a fascinating topic. I could talk for three more hours on this topic, and, it, and certainly we've got lots of questions that we didn't get uh, an opportunity to address. 
Uh, Kevin DeRosa, I saw your question. My apologies. It was an excellent one. We'll have to take that one offline and get back to you, but thank you for asking the question. Um, in, in lieu of time, I wanted to toss it back over to Sarah, um, but just thank all of our panelists uh, for your perspective and your time today. It was great to be with you and thank you. Sarah? Yeah, Dan, I totally agree. What a great topic. And it's so relevant, not just to our daily life, but to commerce and economic impact that transportation has and the success of the future of our region. So thank you to all of our panelists for joining us today in this conversation. I want to um, wrap it up, but before I do, I want to ask all of our sponsors to pop back in for just a minute and um, conclude by thanking Deloitte once again for your support of today's topic and all of our series sponsors, including Cox Business and Arizona State University. And then I'm gonna ask our presenting sponsors, two of them to um, share just a few quick words before we conclude. So first I'm gonna throw it to Eric Barkum of Dignity Health, and then he'll turn it over to Ryan Smith of Phoenix Mesa Gateway Airport. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, thank you all for having me today. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, Julie Graham from Dignity Health, who many of you may know, offered me the opportunity to come in and say a few words about an exciting project that we're working on here in the East Valley. Uh, so I was excited to do that. And uh, it's interesting, we're talking about the expanding Southeast Valley and transportation. And so um, I guess the way that this kind of folds into that is transportation and access to care, healthcare. Um, anyone who's driven past uh, the Val Vista exit on the 202 South in, in the last uh, 18 months or so has likely seen a very large structure and maybe been uh, curious about it. And so I want to share with you that's uh, Dignity Health's, uh, it's Arizona's first women's and children's pavilion, and we're really excited about it coming online here in the next couple of years, and really what it, uh, what it is is a collaboration between Dignity Health and um, our wonderful partners at Phoenix Children's. And now this pavilion is uh, going to focus exclusively on elevating uh, capacity and just the level of care for uh, maternity and pediatrics. And so all of Mercy Gilbert's um, maternity services, labor and delivery, is going to move into this new pavilion. Um, and the other, that's going to be about 40% of the pavilion, and the other 60% is going to be um, operated by Phoenix Children's. And they're really going to elevate the level of uh, pediatric care in the East Valley. Um, one of the quotes that I love to share from Bob Meyer, um, CEO of Phoenix Children's, is that they're committed to being able to take care of 90 to 95% of all pediatric uh, cases in that pavilion. And as, as many of you know, uh, currently um, when children um, and babies need uh, unique care or, uh, or elevated care, they're, they're very often, um, they have to go, to go downtown Phoenix for that. So um, anyways, it's a really exciting project for us and um, we just love the partnership with Phoenix Children's. The hospital itself will almost double in size uh, when the project is complete. So um, we just think it's going to be a wonderful resource and elevate the level of care here in the East Valley for years to come. Eric, that is so exciting. Thank you for sharing that with us. And Ryan? Well, we've already we've already plugged everything we've got going on here. So what I'll say is, is that uh, for all of the participants on here and that, that watch later, uh, over the next year, you're going to hear a lot about transportation funding, both from Gilbert, from the county. Please be involved. Please support that. Uh, that is truly going to be critical in our growth, in the region's growth, um, and, and we've seen the benefits that, uh, that fully funding our transportation system, uh, all of the benefits that that brings. So please be supportive of that. Please go out, learn more, tell your friends and family, and, uh, and, and look at all the exciting things that will happen in the Southeast Valley over the next couple of years. That's great. Thanks again to all of our sponsors. Finally, thank you to today's panelists, Supervisor Jack Sellers, Vice Mayor Jan Kaprowski, Ryan Smith, and to our facilitator, Dan Henderson. Thanks for always doing such a great job. I always appreciate you. And thanks to everyone for joining us today and for your investment in time, and I wish you safe and happy holiday season. Thanks all.